Can you hear me? Yeah, it's not so much. Now, better, better. Okay, so welcome to this. Uh, is it too much? Is it too much? I think. <laughs> Are you up? Um, so, welcome to the second day of this uh, lecture series. Today is dedicated to uh, mathematical tools um, and signal processing and, and model analysis, let's say. This lecture in particular is going to be quite different from the ones that you've seen yesterday, because in a way we are going to take a, a, a little step back to review a bit of fundamentals, particularly in terms of, uh, let's say, in signal processing, I would say. Um, so that we make sure that you understand every single line of code that, uh, or algorithm that has been uh, uh, described yesterday. And uh, let's say that uh, to understand how I should put this, uh, this uh, talk, this lecture, I would first like to ask you some questions. Um, here I collect five questions that yesterday after re looking at the slides. And I would like you to tell me if you find these questions easy, very easy or not so easy, just to understand uh, how I should tune, uh, let's say, the presentation. So the first question is, uh, uh, well, uh, very de definition wise, do you know what is the difference between an impulse response, what is the link between impulse response and transfer function? How many of you find this question uh, not so obvious? Okay. Um, then let's say uh, yesterday you learned that the DMD looks for eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a propagator by building it from the data. And these are obviously complex harmonics. Do you understand why? I mean, who is fully familiar on, on why it has to be the case? Fully familiar, raise the hand. Not so much. Um, then uh, one key step in the algorithm uh, that was shown yesterday by Professor Smith when it was uh, computing, linking the eigenvalues mu k of the propagator to the terms that are in the Van der Moor matrix. There is this uh, uh, operation. This is linking continuous and discrete frequencies. How many of you find this obvious? Not so much. Uh, last, let's say that... Uh, I, I, I take my laptop now, I solve a very simple ODE, uh, second order. Sorry. <laughs> I'll correct that, but we will edit also in the record. Um, the, so the question number four, if, if I solve, let's say now this, uh, this, uh, this ODE, and I give you uh, 100 uh, values for the, for the Ys, for the input, 100 values for the output, and then I ask you, can you tell me what coefficients I've used? And you cannot cheat, so you cannot use machine learning and just run an optimization. You just take paper and pen and, tell, and you find them. Is it, uh, how many of you find this very easy? Okay, and the last point, let's say that they give you a multi-scale signal, so a signal that has multiple frequencies, each uh, that do not exist necessarily in the same time frame, and I ask you to split it into the parts, into the scales that are in the signal. So in this particular case, you will have something like this. You can use your smartest student, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. But uh, you have to give him like 10 minutes, 10 minutes. <laughs> Like you wake him up the night or something and he has to give you the answer quickly. Okay? Well, so uh, this is more or less the, the, let's say, the material. I will ask you the same questions during the coffee break after the lecture. Uh, so uh, this is, a, let's say, a review on signal processing, if you want. Very compressed one, so it's going to be quite uh, packed, I would say. Uh, it's divided into three parts. Uh, first, some generalities about signals and systems and which one are the ones that you are mostly interested as a fluid dynamicist. Then we talk a bit about signals and the problem of representation. The notion of signal implies the notion of basis, so we will review a bit uh, uh, this. Then we enter into LTI system. We talk about convolutions and eigenfunctions, LTI system in their eigenspace. And then I will close with frequency analysis and filters and how they set up the stage for multi-resolution analysis, which is going to be a big topic uh, today. And so I will close with a review on, uh, on what is next, so how this lecture should support the one that comes uh, afterwards. 
So some definitions about signal and system. So uh, a signal is a function of uh, any variable of which you are interested, velocity, pressure, or whatever. And uh, I'm here going to assume that everything is a function of time. Of course, you can take it as a function of space. Then we talk about linear translation uh, invariant. But here we take a dynamical system perspective, let's say. So uh, everything is a function of time. Uh, and I will use uh, this notation for a continuous signal. And when we have a discrete signal, so it's sampled over a, a, a grid, a time uh, discrete, uh, uh, a time discretization, which I will assume uh, uniform. So delta t is one over f s is your sampling frequency. Then I can either use this notation saying that my function is still linked with the, my discrete points are still linked with time. And when I have operations that do not particularly care about the link between the, the signal and the time domain, I will use a sequence notation. Uh, where basically here I'm just saying this is the, the entry one, two, three, four, okay? Without caring if this comes from a, a sampling at one kilohertz or a hundred hertz. Um, systems are uh, mathematical entities, if you want, that takes some, some inputs and give you some input signal and give you some output signal. Um, you can have CISO systems or uh, MIMO system, single input, single output, or multiple input, multiple output. Um, in this uh, lecture, we'll mostly focus on, on CISO because MIMO are better introduced uh, in the state space uh, representation and you will see them uh, tomorrow. Uh, but whatever you see bold phase, uh, that means that uh, I'm uh, referring to, to vectors, okay? So in the case of MIMO, the input is not, uh, it's not just a function, but it will be, let's say, an entry, uh, a vector that is changing in time. So what kind of systems? Uh, well, of course, uh, it's a very obvious question. I mean, uh, many, many systems uh, fit into this input-output framework. There are different families. You can think about the engineering system. Uh, if you take a, a, an airplane, you have uh, thousands of, uh, of systems there. Uh, you can think of the, let's say, the wing itself as a system that takes uh, uh, in input some flow conditions and gives you in output some, uh, some, uh, some lift and drag forces. This is definitely not a linear uh, problem. Uh, you can think of measurement systems. So here now the input is the quantity that you want to measure and the output is the quantity that you actually measure. And they are typically not, not, the, not the same thing. They are linked and, and then you study how the system links them and you calibrate your measurement system, etc. And the last, the one that we will mostly focus on today is on signal processing. Here the input is, is the, the signal that you have sampled and the output is the signal uh, in the way you want it, let's say. So maybe you want to remove some noise, you want to remove some frequencies. So you construct your, signal, your system such that you can achieve that task. And uh, in signal processing, you can also go for problems of detection. This is, for example, an interface tracking algorithm on a high-speed video of, 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 a, uh, of a liquid film uh, recorded with uh, laser-induced fluorescence. Or you can use signal processing directly in the measurement step. This is an example of... Uh, um, a uh, technique called the light absorption measurement where you link the thickness in time and space of a, of a thin liquid to the amount of light that is absorbed uh, from a backward, uh, from a background light, okay? Um, so when we talk about signals, I will uh, now distinguish first between discrete and continuous. Uh, when we talk about discrete si signal, um, you, as I said, you always need to introduce the notion of a basis. And model analysis is all about changing the basis in which you are representing the very same signal. Uh, now, if I take, for example, a sample, here I take uh, a vector of five, so I've collected five points. And the moment I have collected some points, uh, I've, I can create a vector, which by default is going to be a column vector. And if I tell you that this vector is one, three, zero, four, and five, so you represent it like that. I am automatically, implicitly assuming that behind the line I have a, a Cartesian basis, which in signal processing would be uh, an, an, a shifted input delta, uh, shift, uh, basis of shifted impulses. And uh, the process of representing the signal is, is a comparison process. So if I tell you that this is 1, 3, 0, 4, 5, etc., it's because I'm telling you that this signal has 1 of this guy, 3 of this one, 0 of this, 4 of that, and 5 of that. Okay? the representation of the signal itself requires the notion of a basis. And this is so obvious that you don't even think about it when you write down your signal. So uh, in, in sequence perspective, this delta function, this Cartesian basis, 
you can write it like that. You have uh, 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 you have shifted impulse, shifted deltas that are one at one specific point and zero everywhere else, and they have the very special property, very difficult to to, to translate in the continuous domain, that the sum over the whole possible uh, uh, sp time span of your signal is one. And the comparison process, when we say, for example, that uh, u of 1 is equal to 3, because it means that at k equal 1, u looks a lot like 3, is automatically using, behind the line, the notion of an inner product. So you know from, from basic algebra that the inner product between two vectors, you can write it like that, is, uh, is the b dag a, where the dag is trans, uh, transposition and conjugation. I repeat, I'm assuming every vector is a column. And that is simply by definition the sum of the product with one of them being conjugated. <coughs> so when you are thinking about the signal, if I, if I ask you what is the entry number three, your brain is automatically doing an inner product between your signal and your basis, and that basis only exists at that specific input, and then you tell me at three, your signal looks a lot like four deltas, for example. Okay? But now, this notion is so intuitive in time, when we go to other bases, it becomes a bit more uh, tricky, but the, the, co the concept is still the same. Um, another way of seeing it, typical in signal processing, is through convolution. So you look at the signal and you see it as a combination, a weighted combination of shifted deltas, okay? And this is a convolution. We will see in matrix notation that here we are writing something really useless. We are writing a vector times identity. Okay, it doesn't really sound important, but you will see it in action later. Uh, and then, of course, you can use inner products to define some notions from signal processing. For example, the length of a vector uh, is linked to what we call energy of a signal, even if that is not necessarily a physical energy. Uh, and then the other one, very important one, is the notion of correlation. So when two vectors, you, you remember from, uh, from basic algebra that the cosine of the angle between two vectors is coming from this expression that has the inner product. And now, uh, when the two vectors are orthogonal, so the cosine is zero, we will say in signal processing that they are uncorrelated. If they are aligned, then we will say that they are highly correlated. They look similar because they are aligned. The vector representation that they have uh, are aligned, okay? And uh, uh, using the same tools, we touch on another important argument, which is the notion of projection. You remember uh, from uh, basic algebra that if you want to project some, a vector onto another vector, this is the operation that you have to do, is again taking the inner product and dividing by the length on the vector on which you're projecting. But if the vector on which I am projecting has a unitary length, then the inner product is also already the uh, projection and the correlation between the two, okay? And uh, asking for this to be of unitary length is what happens in model analysis, and we will see it uh, today. Um, as I said, when we want to move to continuous signal, there are some technical difficulties that I address in the notes. The notes contain much more material than what I can present here. Uh, I would say I didn't have time to make them shorter. Um, and uh, you have also a lot of exercises there. So on this part, I will, I will go quite fast. Simply think of a continuous signal as a discrete one in which the delta t gets to zero. And so it does not really make sense anymore to talk about the inner product in this way, and you have to take integrals. This seems obvious, but uh, should already trigger a change of perspective. Because first of all, the units are not the same, right? Here you're taking, uh, let's say this is, uh, I don't know, Pascal. This is Pascal squared but here you're bringing time. So when you go to continuous, you start thinking more in terms of densities, okay? But uh, this is, as I said, this is a topic that I will not touch too much. Um, and because of uh, the difficulties when you go to continuous world, um, the delta functions now has to spike to infinity in the position where you place it. Uh, we can discuss about that later. And we still want to preserve this property. So this delta function is not a, a, a normal function is a generalized function that lets you respect this property, lets you move the sampling idea to the continuous domain. But besides that, for what I would present, you can think of a discrete uh, signal, a discrete sequence, as what you obtain when you take a continuous one and you replace time by, by the discretized uh, time. When you do this, some important things happen. You should keep in mind at least two uh, 
so the first exercise is really trivial. I give you a signal which is made of an exponential times uh, a cosine, and I ask you to derive the discrete sequence associated to that under some kind of sampling. Uh, here was 100 Hertz, and I ask you 320 points. So if you introduce this discretization here, uh, you take out the K, you have uh, this term here, this becomes a power, and if you plug this into the cosine, you arrive at a digital harmonic. Two big uh, observations, exponentials becomes power, and Laplace transform becomes zeta transform, and DMD is a very special case of that. Uh, and the other observation is that uh, this guy uh, might not behave the way you expect. For example, if I write it like this in terms of digital frequency, and here I put any integer, this will not be an harmonic, it will always be one. And if I take here uh, a digital frequency and then I add any other uh, integer, I get the same signal. Uh, do you know what's the name for this problem? It's the aliasing, right? So basically, uh, you have multiple representation of the same harmonic. Uh, and if you want to avoid aliasing, what you typically do is you say, okay, I will limit myself within a range of, the, of the discrete frequencies. And typically, you take from minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5. And uh, you don't want to take anything which is outside that. And you hope that there is nothing outside that in your signal because otherwise you have aliasing. Okay. Um, most of operations that we will see this afternoon prefer this range because of symmetry of the matrices that are involved there. But then uh, you might do most of your math here and then go back here. And there is an important common in MATLAB or Python to do that, which is FFT shift. Huh? You, you're familiar with this common. Um, so, okay, you introduce your discretization here, you do, you arrange your terms here, you have your sampling frequency. If you want to respect that, what you have to impose is that your sampling frequency respects this condition, which is, of course, the Nyquist uh, criteria. <coughs> now, uh, convolutions and eigenfunctions, when we talk about uh, linear systems, so first of all, what does it really mean to be uh, an LTI, to have an LTI system? So an LTI system is first of all a linear system, and the system is linear if satisfy homogeneity and superposition. So homogeneity means that if I multiply my input by 10, my output is also multiplied by 10. And superposition means that if I introduce three inputs, I get all together, I get in the output the sum of the three uh, input uh, outputs taken uh, independently. And in the continuous case, you can consider infinitely close uh, inputs and uh, extend this idea into integral. So linearity means that a linear combination of inputs produces the same linear combination of outputs. When I say the same, I mean that I have the same coefficients. And time invariancy means simply that the system does not change mind. So if I ask him, uh, uh, how do you respond to that at this particular time, and then I shift my, my, my input, then the output is the same, but it's just shifted. So that means time invariance. And an LTI system is both linear and time invariant. Um, if linearization that you will see tomorrow uh, involves is the process of taking a nonlinear problem and uh, and treat it as a linear because you are taking a, a very limited range of uh, let's say of your independent variable, uh, the notion of time invariancy involves scales. So if your system is changing at such a large scale compared to the one in which you are observing, then you can treat it as a linear time invariant system. Okay. So if I ask you, I don't know, a question right now, maybe in five minutes you will reply in the same way, but if I ask you the same question tonight, maybe you will change mind. So it's all about scales. And this uh, brings to the most important fact about LTI system is that you, you need very little, you need to know very little about them to know actually how they will behave in all the cases. And this is linked to the notion of impulse response. So let's say that uh, you take your signal and you introduce as an input just one impulse at k equals zero, at the origin. And your system responds with uh, uh, what we call a, an impulse response, which is your h, okay? But we said that every signal is a linear combination of shifted impulses. And so if now we introduce the notion of linear time invariance that we've seen before, what's gonna happen is that, well, the first impulse will generate this response, the second one will generate this one, the third this one, et cetera, et cetera. So every impulse generates an impulse response shifted and modulated by the value that the signal takes at that specific time. 
And because of superposition, the final response to all of that will be, of course, the sum of that. And this is convolution. Okay, that's really the essence of, of a linear time invariant system. So convolution of the input uh, with the impulse response tells you how the system will respond to everything you want. Which, um, okay, here then I derive it a bit more formally. You have it there in, in your notes. I think the take home message here is that convolution is a, is a commutative operation. So you can, you can do it, uh, uh, you, can, you can shift the, the two if you want. And, and this is a very beautiful matrix representation that we will see today that uh, let us discover more things about the link between POD and Fourier. But this we will see it this afternoon. Uh, the last point, and then we'll take a little break uh, for questions, is if I told you that uh, convolution describes the mapping from the input to the output in a linear system, uh, I now want to ask you what happens when this input is a special one and is a complex harmonic. Uh, a complex harmonic, I prefer to represent it in a continuous domain like this, where you have e to the st and s is your complex frequency, which I represented in a Cartesian form. And in the discrete world, because I know that uh, exponentials becomes power, I will prefer a, a polar representation. So in this case, if sigma is zero, then this is just a Fourier mode, it's just an harmonic. And to have an harmonic here, I need the rho to be one, right? Um, here, if sigma is positive, this thing will explode. And here, if rho is bigger than one, this thing will explode and vice versa, it will, it will decay. Now, if you introduce this, uh, this particular input on a discrete system, um, you take a convolution, because that's how you link the response to any input. And what you see in the convolution that you have a term that does not depend on L, so you can take it out. And what you have here is actually a number if this summation converges, and in most stable systems it will converge. So what is happening here is that I'm giving to the, sig to the system an input, and the system is res responding with the same, but just multiplied by a number. And this is an, an eigenvalue problem, right? So what we are saying then is that uh, in, in linear algebra way of saying this, we will say that uh, uh, complex harmonics diagonalize uh, convolution matrices, okay? Which is a notion that we will see this afternoon. It simply means that if you apply a convolution on that, you get back the same thing, multiplied by something. And that something here is the transfer function which is the zeta transform in a discrete setting of the input response, okay? And in the continuous case, you do the same with integrals, and then you get that the transfer function in the continuous is the Laplace transform of your impulse response, okay? Uh, so this is a very simple exercise for you, and now we start going towards system identification. Uh, let's say that you have a system, you don't know anything about what is inside, but it's linear. All you know, it's linear. You test it for homogeneity, you test it for, uh, uh, for superposition, and more or less is okay. Maybe it's not perfectly linear, but, but it's, let's say, realistic to assume it, it is. Then you do uh, a step function test. You just put a step as an input. He responds, uh, let's say, in this way. You can fit your regression, and you have this step-like response. And at this point, you know everything you need to know about your system. Because from that, you can get the input response, and then you can get everything else. And so here I ask you in this exercise, what will be the, uh, the response to, let's say, a complex exponential? And uh, I ask you to do the exercise of deriving the discrete sequences associated to that. Okay. Uh, and to do this with different uh, sampling frequency, let's say 3 hertz and 10 hertz, and see that if you increase the sampling, of course, you converge to the continuous case. Do this exercise as much as you can, because you came here to learn exactly the other way around. So uh, taking the continuous and going to the discrete is something that you learned uh, uh, in your undergraduate courses. And what you came here to learn is to do the opposite. I give you data. From the data, you will fit sequences. You will use your regression to get sequences. And these sequences maps on the continuous world using the, the, the equation that I'm showing you here. Okay? So be familiar with, the, with, the way, uh, with, with this way, because it's the one that the, usually should be the easy one, because then uh, you will learn uh, easily how to go backwards. So I will take some questions for the moment, if you, if you have. Please. Ah, the microphone. 